Welcome to Hemp Barons. I have a feeling that people are going to be looking back about six months from now and say, wow, I wish I would have moved on hemp when I had the chance. John Porterfield from the Hemp Holding Company is today's guest. And his story is an example of being in the right place at the right time. Because when the hemp bill passed, he already was processing organic hemp in Montana, which was one of the few states approved to process hemp. On the show, John talks about how his business has exploded and his plans for expansion. Let's join my conversation with John Porterfield. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're really excited to talk to you. I think maybe before we jump into talking about Hemp Holding Company, let's take a few minutes to talk about the Farm Bill, which passed, for those of our listeners who are not familiar with this, uh, it passed at the end of the year. Tell us how that has changed the hemp landscape. What's new? Well, it's really opened up the entire landscape for hemp, because it, and particularly for me, too, because we had a meeting that day in Great Falls, and a lot of our farmers that grew hemp last year, we came together to kind of share stories. And I uh, got an interview on Montana Public Radio, and that turned into a quite a rash of phone calls for the next few weeks after that. It was called the Pimp Leader in Montana. The Farm Bill really did open it up. It really just kind of it took the blinders off from people that wanted to either invest in the industry or those that wanted to grow that were on the fence or, uh, you know, it's just really, it's exciting. Well, and you're in Montana. And Montana was already sort of teed up for it. So when Farm Bill passed, you guys are sitting in the in the catbird seat. Yeah, Montana was unique because we stayed within the guidelines of the DEA. And so North Dakota and Montana followed the, their federal guidelines right to the letter. And so I think that provided some unique opportunities, but it also provided some challenges for the industry. So some of the challenges, I believe, are starting to go away meaning we'll have access to more and more varieties and a broader use that we can develop. But but also we had some advantages that by following federal guidelines, we were able to open up federal water so that our hemp farmers that used federal water sources could actually pull that because the year prior, we could not. I mean, it's just great because you guys have a head start over the rest of the states that didn't follow it or weren't prepared for this. But Let's jump forward and talk about your company, Hemp Colding Company. I read on your website you have nearly 600 acres of organic hemp. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's going to grow to more than a thousand acres, I'm sure. Maybe one of my farm managers says it'll be probably 15 to 20,000 acres you know, and not too long. Oh but no, I'm gonna be, I'll be contracting for at least a few thousand acres this year. And Montana is expected to be probably in the neighborhood of 100,000 acres of hemp this year. Oh my gosh. I'm on your website right now and I'm just looking at all the products that a few years ago you would have never, ever seen on a website. But you must just walk us through some of the products that are available to people just from your website. Yeah. Interesting enough, some of the very early support and questions came from a smokable hemp, actually having it available in pre-rolls. And so I really higher quality hemp flour, we were able to harvest that and then put that into a, a pre-roll machine and actually have like a pre-rolled cigarette. That, the joke was that you couldn't smoke the hemp and don't bother. You know, you'd have to smoke an entire field to get high. But no one was really interested in getting high from it. They wanted the body effect of the CBDs and they could dose it themselves by having their own cigarette. So the heating of it is what generates the CBD. That was one thing that was really kind of a surprise. But we heard about it years ago from European sources that smokable hemp is going to be very popular. And sure enough, it was some of the very early purchases have been for that. And then some of the other things have been relationships with businesses that would like to get into the production side, but really don't have a lot to set up yet. And so that's what we ran into is that as we grew with these crops, that there was no processing. And so we been doing it on trial basis with various different companies that one that wants to make vinegar. So it's a food item that would go through our public health and human services. So a different process, you know, to be registered for that. They want to make the vinegar from my hemp. And then they would also like to make biochar instead of biochar from a bioreactor. So we've proven that we can actually take a, a waste product from the cannabis industry products that have already been extracted of their CBD and actually use that and put it through a bioreactor and create it into char. So it's still a useful soil amendment. 
just an explosion of products that could start happening here. I, I mean, it's just incredible to, when you start to think about it. Oh, I mean, I'm just looking at your website right now and you have hemp seed oil and you have the hemp stock and you have the hemp herd, hemp pellets, hemp seed, hemp flour, mm -hmm. hemp root. Of course, the vinegar that you just talked about, yeah. you're really just scratching the surface right now. I know. And, and really scratching under the surface. We're trying to find ways <laughs> that we can harvest the roots because the Parkinson's Foundation and a number of other people with that have tremors find that the root treatments are the treatments that help them break that tremor. So it's we're excited. We're trying to find ways that we can grow it more like a potato crop. There's so many different ways to grow it, depending on what equipment you have available to you. I'm excited for rural America, really rural Montana in this case, because everyone that can contract through me is going to have a brighter future. I mean, it looks like we'll be able to make considerably more than any of the other crops that we've ever grown in Montana on a per acre basis. Now, this is a real good opportunity. Like It could be like a once-in-a-generation opportunity to really seize the moment on the hemp crop and take advantage of the pricing right now. I mean, right. I think that's the main thing, to take advantage of the unique ability to get into the processing, to really get into making the product or the raw material where you're taking the raw biomass. It's easy enough to grow, and the farmers want to focus on growing. They don't want to focus on the next step, which is very expensive and takes much more risk. And frankly, that's where the investors need to come in. That's really where the business of making things out of all this hemp is really the exciting part. There's potentially you know, 50,000 different uses. There's machines for all those different uses. Some that are parallel to existing industries where we're you know, getting into bioplastics, that bioplastics you know, we're taking away from styrofoam, we're using the same equipment where we'll use it as fuels, where we'll be using it in concrete. You see my pellets on the website. Those yeah. pellets are now a universal commodity. They don't have any viable seeds in them. They've been milled up and crushed and put into a pellet. But the pellets are compressed so that it doesn't bulk out equipment. You know, As far as putting it on a truck, it becomes a heavier, denser material. And it's also very consistent so that the hempcrete industry that would like to use hemp as a, a lightning additive basically a specialty additive that makes it lighter. So concrete that's lighter is less expensive to transport and potentially has these other antimicrobial benefits. And we've only just in our infancy on that. You think about block machinery and the types of blocks that are out there, heavy concrete blocks, and if they could be made lighter by including the hemp pellets. I've said this before, this is going to change the world. There's not just medical benefits from it. It touches every single thing in our lives. Speaking of investing and investment opportunities, <laughs> yes. you have so much on your plate right now. I mean, you're, it's impossible to do this out of cash flow. So how are you going to fund this growth? Well, the plan really is to get some investors involved that will help to buy the equipment. We need, it's just a matter of getting the equipment. It's basically cleaning the seed. The most benign part of this whole hemp industry is in the hemp seed itself. So cleaning the seed is the critical step, getting it to a final spec of 99.95%. So that's you know, 3 or $4 million for that equipment to just clean it. Mm -hmm. And then it takes a couple million dollars just for the presses to press it now into a hemp seed oil, which is a fantastic commodity. So that's step one. And then this fiber production, it takes a few million dollars just to get into decortication machinery that is going to create enough product that you'll have some fiber to do anything with. And you'll also create herd out of that process too. So there's just two primary parts that will all take three to $5 million to establish. But you know what, to me, it just doesn't seem like a lot because the return on the investment is going to be, it's, it's going to be so fast. And then you create this barrier to entry that is going to make it difficult for anybody. If you're the first mover in this, you have such an advantage. And like I said, you're sitting right in the catbird seat, sitting up there in Montana, already doing this while other states are trying to get all their paperwork in place. Yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of good relationships already built. The state of Montana has had their act together now for about four years doing this. So they've made the programs a lot more palatable to the farmers to participate in. So it means that we have 50 million acres, 50.8 million acres, technically, of farmland in Montana. We have about five and a half million of that is in wheat and our commodity prices are down. So guess what? We're all looking. There's millions and millions of acres that farmers will be making decisions on over the course of the next month or two. If companies want to gain that position, this is that rare chance Yeah, because you, you can get in on this year's crop. We've been speaking with John Porterfield, who is the CEO of Hemp Holding Company. 
And we'll have all of John's information, his email address, because I'm confident there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want to reach out to you. Uh, I'll have your email address. We'll also have Hemp Holding Company's website address on the MJ Bulls website. And now is the time. All these people that have been sitting on the fence, if you want to get in, this is the time. So, John, it's been great. Thanks for the education. Really good to meet you. And yeah, thanks, Dan. Yeah, can you make it a point to be back on the show once this thing gets rolling? Absolutely. I'd love to. It'd be a uh, great energy. We're trying to grow all organically, too. So, trying to spread the good word of uh, organic good food and good for the environment, too. So, well, good luck and keep me posted. All right. Thank you. I will look forward to it. 